It is great to be with you. It's been a while since I've been here, so I'm glad to be back. Although I got to be honest with you, I'm glad to be anywhere after what happened to me in Little Rock, Arkansas. I went to Little Rock to speak at a charity event, and this pastor picks me up from the airport. And we're chatting along the way as you know, so we're driving along. He said, yeah, he said, I, I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. She said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ, is he still living? <laughs> so I'm glad to be anywhere. I'm glad to be alive after that. But uh, it's great to be here. My wife has joined me, and uh, we're enjoying Albuquerque. Had some great food last night. And um, uh, so these days I get to travel around the country and talk about Jesus, which it doesn't get better than that. But, um, but, but I've had some embarrassing things happen along the way. The most embarrassing one was um, I was down south speaking at a conference with my buddy Mark, and the next day we had to fly home. We had to get some breakfast. And we saw one of these Cracker Barrel restaurants. Do you have these here? Cracker Barrel? Yeah. So I'd never been to one. So he said, we got to go to Cracker Barrel. So all right. So we noticed they have rocking chairs on the front porch where people sit and people watch while they're waiting for a table. So in order for us to get to the front door, we had to walk in front of two people in rocking chairs. First one was a young woman, about 18 years old, dark hair, dark eyes, young man about the same age next door. We had to walk in front of them. Not a big deal, right? So we're walking along. And just as I step in front of this young woman, I hear her say, what's a deist? And I thought, I just wrote a book about that. So I turned on my heel. I said, young lady, a deist is someone who believes that God created the universe. And then he walked away. A deist is someone who believes that God sort of wound up the universe like a giant clock and is just letting it tick down. I said, a deist is someone who believes that God is distant and disinterested in us. But I said, that's not what the evidence shows. Begin to give me the evidence for God's involvement in the cosmos, God's involvement with humankind. So I talk about the evidence of cosmology and physics and biochemistry and genetics. I'm just, I'm just laying this stuff on her, and she's looking at me, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger, and I'm on a roll now. You can't stop me. Talk about Jesus entering into human history, the incarnation, his miracles, his death. I started to give her the evidence that Jesus rose from the dead, and she's staring at me, and her eyes are getting bigger and bigger, and I turned to my friend and said, could you believe this? I happened to walk in front of her. She said, what's a deist? My friend said, Lee. She said, buenos dias. <laughs> I really wish that were a joke. That's, that's exactly what happened. It, it was so embarrassing. But you know what the good news was? The ice was already broken. How do you not get into a spiritual conversation at that point, right? Turned out she was there with her boyfriend for the state track meet. And they took us back to the hotel where the coach was and all the athletes, and we got to talk about Jesus for about 45 minutes. So it turned out all right. But man, that was embarrassing. That was embarrassing. So since I was here last time, the big thing in our life is we moved to Texas, uh, moved to Houston. And you wonder, why would anybody move to Houston? And I'll give you one word, and it, you'll just say, okay, I get it. Grandchildren, thank you. Yes, grandchildren. So my two oldest granddaughters uh, live in, in Houston. So we moved down there. And I'm from Chicago. What do I know about Texas? Nothing. So I, no kidding, I went to Amazon and I bought a book called How to Talk Texan. There's a, you can read it. There's a book. I read it. So I learned how to talk Texan. First thing I learned, the difference between y'all and all y'all, that all y'all's plural right? Well, I didn't, we don't use that term in Chicago, so I didn't know that. It makes sense. But the thing I learned about talking Texan that I like the most is that in Texas, if you want to say thank you to someone, you can say thank you, or you can say, I appreciate you. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I, not appreciate it, I appreciate you, I appreciate you. I just think that's so cool. And that's what I want to say to each and every one of you. I appreciate you. I really do. I appreciate you coming out on a weekend and saying, I want to learn more about God. Um, I appreciate you. And I want to start out by telling you something that happened to me, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. I was talking to a guy I know who's a real techie, you know, and he said, Lee, I've discovered something really fascinating. I said, what? He said, I've learned that 200 times a second around the clock, Someone on planet Earth is typing into a search engine basically the question, is God real? I thought, that's fascinating. And I thought, but then again, isn't it logical in a sense because everything hangs on that question? 
Everything depends. On, there's so much that revolves around that question. There was a, a well-known atheist by the name of William Provine. He was in a debate with a Christian. And he said, look, I'm an atheist, but I'll just, I'll just tell you straight up, if there is no creator, five things are true. Number one, there's no evidence for God. Number two, there's no life after death. Number three, there's no absolute foundation for right and wrong. Number four, there's no absolute meaning for life. And number five, we really don't have free will. We're just biochemical machines. So there's a lot hanging on this question, is God real? And yet, a declining number of Americans believe that God is real. Uh, back when I met my wife for the first time, we were 14 years old, freshman in uh, high school, 1966, 98% of Americans believed in God. You know what the number is today? 81%, the lowest in history. And if you ask people, are you sure God exists? It goes down to 6 out of 10. Um, among young people, among Generation Z, the numbers are starker. Um, it's been called the first post- Christian generation. Twice as many young people call themselves atheists as members of my generation. Um, and yet, there are positive trends too. It's not all negative. There are positive trends. Recent survey showed that three out of four American adults say they'd like to grow spiritually. 44% say, I'm more open to God today than I was before the pandemic. And I got a friend by the name of Shane Pruitt, his ministry is to travel the country and to speak to groups of teenagers, young people, college students, and so forth. And he told me this, get this. He said, Lee, in the last three years, I've seen more young people come to faith in Jesus Christ than in the previous 18 years of ministry combined. So there are some affirmative and positive trends as well. Well, based on all this, I decided to write a book. And the book is called, Is God Real? Exploring the Ultimate Question of Life. And in that book, I, I, I look to science, I look to history, I look to philosophy, and try to present in a very accessible way, what is the evidence that God really is real? How do we know? And then I answer, and this is all through experts that I interview, people with PhDs from Cambridge and major universities, and I interview them, ask them the tough questions I had when I was an atheist and that you might have uh, out of curiosity and so. And so I, I explore the question, if God is real, why is there so much suffering in the world? And the other question is, if God is real, why does he seem so hidden? And so I've written that book. It just came out a couple of days ago. We have some copies here. I'd love to sign one for you or maybe write a note to a friend. Maybe you have a colleague who's spiritually confused or a family member, or a son or daughter who's kind of wandering. I'd love to write him a little note and encourage him to read it. All the finances go to the church. So everything's going back to the ministries of the church. Um, I'd love to do that after the service. We've been having great conversations with people um, these last two services. Uh, but in all, there are about 20 lines of evidence and arguments that point toward the fact that God is real. And I deal with several of them in the book, but, but here's the thing. I was an atheist for much of my life. And today, if I were to ask the question, as an atheist, is God real? There are two areas of science that I think are convincing that God is real. And this is based on discoveries that have just happened in the last... 50 years or so. Today, science supports our faith better than any time in history. And so I want to talk about a couple of these areas. How do we know that God is real? And the first area of science has a fancy name, uh, cosmology. And all that means is the origin of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Where did everything come from? And you know, for centuries, scientists believed the universe was eternal. It always existed. It was static. And yet, thanks to persuasive discoveries over the last 50 years or so in cosmology as well as philosophical arguments, virtually every scientist on the planet now concedes the universe had a beginning at some point in the past. The physicist Alexander Vilenkin, who's head of the Cosmology Institute at Tufts University, said, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. In fact, Dr. Vilenkin and two other cosmologists have developed a theorem that says that any universe 
like ours that is expanding throughout its history on average must have had a beginning. In fact, if our universe really ends up being just a small part of an even larger multiverse, that multiverse must have had a beginning. And this leads to what I consider to be kind of the gold standard argument for God being real. Um, it, interestingly, it originated in medieval times among Islamic philosophers, because Islam believes the universe had a beginning too. And, um, of course, nobody believed the universe had a beginning back then. They thought it was static. But now the evidence is the universe did have a beginning. So now this argument has come into the forefront like never before. And here's how it goes. very simple. Number one, first, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Now stop for a second. Can you think of anything that has come into existence that didn't have a cause behind it? No, even the most famous skeptic in history, David Hume said, I never asserted so absurd a proposition as that anything might arise without a cause. So first, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Second, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause behind it. The Bible talks about this. In the very first verse, Genesis 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the phrase heavens and earth is a figure of speech in Hebrew. Um, it's called a mirism. And it simply means God created everything, everything. So cosmology goes a long way toward establishing that God is real. But then there's a common challenge. People will say, oh, well, if God created the universe, then who created God? And that's generally followed by na 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 you know, ever think of that? Well, that's just a misunderstanding of the argument. The argument is not whatever exists has a cause. No philosopher would claim that. The argument is whatever begins to exist has a cause. God, by definition, is eternal. He never began to exist. He has always existed. In fact, before the universe was created, time didn't exist. There was merely timelessness. And so atheists shouldn't have a problem with saying that something is eternal because they used to maintain until they were disproven by the evidence that the universe was eternal. But now we know the universe had a beginning. Now, based on this, we can draw some conclusions about the Creator. Nine conclusions about His identity. Number one, He must be transcendent because He exists apart from His creation. Number two, he must be spirit or immaterial because he existed before the material world was created. Third, he must be timeless or eternal because he existed before physical time came into being. Fourth, he must be powerful given the immensity of the creation event. Number five, he must be incredibly smart given the amazing precision of the creation event. Six, he must be personal because he had to make the decision to create. Number seven, he must be creative, because my goodness, just look at the beauty of the universe. Very creative. Number eight, he must be loving or caring, because he so purposefully uh, crafted a habitat where you and I can flourish in. And then finally, the scientific principle of Occam's razor tells us there would be just one creator. So what have we got here? Transcendent, spirit, Eternal, powerful, smart, personal, creative, caring, unique. Friends, that is a description of the God of the Bible. In fact, since there's just one creator, this rules out polytheistic religions like Hinduism that says there's a multiplicity of creators. And since the creator is separate from creation, this rules out pantheistic religions like Buddhism, which say that everything is God. And since the universe is not cyclical, this contradicts Eastern philosophies. And since the origin of the universe um, uh, also contradicts ancient religious assumptions that the universe is static. So friends, I mean, you look at those nine qualities that we can elicit just from this one argument for the existence of God, and I'm telling you what, honestly, if I were still an atheist, this would convince me that God is real. But then it's amplified by a second area of science in which, again, we've just had discoveries over the last 50 years or so that point toward the fact that God is real. And that second area of science is called physics. 
physics. All physics is, is uh, they're the numbers that govern the operation of the universe. Friends, one of the striking discoveries of modern science has been that the laws of physics and the constants of physics and numbers that govern the operation of the universe unexpectedly conspire in an extraordinary way to make the universe habitable for life. In other words, our universe is finely tuned on a razor's edge that defies the explanation that it could have been something that happened by mere chance, and it's better explained as the work of a god. It's like this. If you go out at night in the summer, let's say, and it's a clear night, and, and, and you look up at the sky and you expect to see thousands of stars, right? But on this night, that's not what you see. You look up and you see 50 to 100 giant dials in the sky. And each dial represents a number that governs the operation of the universe. And each dial has the potential of being calibrated to one of trillions or trillions of possible settings, and yet all of these 50 to 100 dials are exactly calibrated to the precise position so that life can exist. Friends, that is a picture that modern physics gives us of our world. It's absolutely extraordinary. Or as Psalm 19 verse 1 said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. I can give you a couple examples of these dials and how they're finely calibrated. Um, we all know what the force of gravity is, right? You know what gravity is? If you drop something, it's going to hit the ground. Well, gravity happens to be finely tuned on a razor's edge so that you can exist. So imagine a ruler that goes across the entire universe, 15 billion light years across the universe, this ruler, and it's broken down in one-inch increments. This represents plausibly the range along which a force of gravity could have been set anywhere along that ruler, and yet it's set at the exact right place so that life can exist. What if we were to change the setting? What if we were to change the setting one inch compared to the 15 billion light-year width of the universe? Guess what? Intelligent life would be impossible anywhere in the universe. That's just one of those dials. There's 50 to 100 of these things. Another one is the strong nuclear force. That binds together the nucleus of atoms, keeps the atoms together. What if you changed it? What if you decreased that force by just one part in 10,000 billion, 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 billion? If you did that, all we would have in the universe would be hydrogen. Life would be impossible. Or my favorite one, the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force. That is finely tuned to one part in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. Now, how do we understand something like that? Well, one scientist gave an illustration. He said, imagine a continent the size of North America. And then imagine dimes are piled on that continent all the way to the moon, 238,000 miles. Can you imagine how many dimes that would be? Now imagine a billion continents the size of North America. All of them with dimes piled 238,000 miles into the sky. Pick one dime at random. Spray paint it red. Mix it up among all those billion continents going up 238,000 miles. And then blindfold one person and say, you can, you can wander among all of these dimes, but you can only pick out one dime at random. You're blindfolded. You pick it out. What are the odds it would be the dime that had been spray painted red? One chance in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. That is how finely tuned it is. Friends, this is just, it is absolutely mind-blowing. I, I was interviewing a, a famous physicist about this, and I said, what are the chances that this could have just happened by chance? And he looked at me and said, well, we scientists have a, a scientific term for that. I said, what is it? He said, ain't going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just mind-blowing. The evidence is so strong that Dr. Vera Kistiakowski, uh, professor of physics at MIT, former president of the Association of Women in Science, said this, the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of the physical world calls for the divine. In other words, this points toward the fact 
that God is real. Now, how do you get around that if you're a skeptic? How do you get around that if you're an atheist? By the way, the famous atheist Christopher Hitchens uh, said this is the strongest argument that people that, that God exists, of all the arguments that God exists. This fine-tuning, you just can't get around it. But people try, and here's the way they try. They say, what if we're just one universe? What if there's an infinite number of other universes we don't know about? And what if you spin those dials at random in an infinite number of universes, sooner or later, one of them is going to hit the jackpot, and we won the cosmic lottery? Could that be an explanation? Well, there's, there's one huge problem with that. There is absolutely no physical evidence that an infinite number of other universes exist. In fact, one of the most famous uh, theoretical physicists in the world, uh, Sabine Hossenfelder, who's an agnostic, she doesn't believe in God, but she said just recently, she said this theory of an infinite number of universes, she says, quote, it's a waste of time from a scientific perspective. She said, very popular with the media, but very few scientists anywhere take it seriously. Besides, get this, if one universe requires an explanation, then an infinite number of universes requires an even bigger explanation, and that points even more powerfully toward God. Friends, I'm telling you, if I were still an atheist, just these two areas of science, cosmology and physics, would convince me that God is real. And then the question becomes, well, wait a second, if God is real, which God exactly are we talking about? The God of Islam? The God of, which God are we talking about? And then we have to switch from looking at science to looking at history. And the question becomes, is Jesus, who we claim to be, the unique Son of God, and therefore Christianity, is true. And how do we investigate that? By investigating the historical data concerning the resurrection of Jesus. Why is that, why is that so important? Because Jesus, in a variety of different ways, made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. At one point, he got up before a group like this, John 10, verse 30, and he says, I and the Father are one. And the Greek word there for one is not masculine, it's neuter. So Jesus was not saying, I and the Father are the same person. He was saying, I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature. We're one in essence. And how did the audience understand what he was saying? They picked up stones to kill him because they said, you, you're just a man, and you're claiming to be God. So Jesus claimed to be God, but so what? I could claim to be God. Nate could claim to be God. Skip, well, maybe not skip. Um, <laughs> anybody could claim to be God, right? But if Jesus claimed to be God, died, and then three days later rose from the dead, that's pretty good evidence he's telling the truth, right? That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. What was he saying? He was saying, look, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not an actual event of history, you are fully justified in walking out. That's how fundamental it is. And so in my book, I, I interview one of the leading historians on the resurrection of Jesus. Got his PhD from the University of Pretoria in South Africa, uh, written monumental books on this topic, and he goes through all the evidence. So I'm going to summarize it very quickly for you so you can get a grasp of how powerful the evidence is that Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. So we celebrate the resurrection on Easter. Easter begins with the letter E. I'll give you four words that begin with the letter E that summarize the evidence for the resurrection. The first E stands for execution, that Jesus was truly dead after being crucified. Friends, we have no record anywhere of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. In fact, no less of a source than the Journal of the American Medical Association, a secular, scientific, peer-reviewed medical journal carried an investigation into the death of Jesus, and this was their conclusion, quote, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. And you know what? This is not controversial among scholars in the field, including skeptical scholars. Why? Because when we study ancient history, we're lucky if we have one good source or two good sources to confirm a fact. And yet, for the death of Jesus on the cross, we not only have multiple early first century accounts in the New Testament, we've got five ancient sources outside the Bible 
corroborating that Jesus was dead. In fact, you could go to an atheist historian like Gerd Ludemann of Vanderbilt University, and he'll tell you this, quote, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. In, that's the atheist scholar talking. It's indisputable. First E is for execution. Jesus was dead. Second E stands for early. We have early accounts that Jesus rose from the dead. In other words, reports that came virtually immediately after his death. Why is that important? Because I used to think, like a lot of skeptics, that the resurrection was a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world. The great historian A.N. Sherwin-White said the passage of two generations of time is not even enough for legend to grow up and wipe out a solid core of historical truth. So I knew it took time, so I figured maybe 100, 200 years after the life of Jesus, legends were invented, mythologies were spun, and that's where the idea of the resurrection came from. But then I discovered this. This blew my mind. We have a report of the resurrection of Jesus, including named eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses that has been dated back by scholars to within months of his death. To within months. This is, this is historical gold to have something that quick in the historical record. Um, the Apostle Paul preserved it for us. It came in the form of a creed of the first Christians, and he wrote it in a letter to the church in Corinth. You can look it up later in your Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. But that passage there predates so much. goes right back. In fact, one of the greatest historians who ever lived, Dr. James D.G. Dunn, said, quote, this tradition we can be entirely confident, was formulated as a tradition within months of the death of Jesus. Friends, that's a newsflash from ancient history. There's no time gap between the death of Jesus and the later development of a legend that he rose from the dead. We got a newsflash that goes right back to the beginning. And that's not the only early report. We've got others in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, all of which date back to the first century, so early they were circulating during the lifetimes of Jesus' contemporaries who would have been all too happy to point out the errors if they were making this stuff up. So we got an execution. Jesus is dead. We have reports of his resurrection that are so early, so immediate, you can't just write them off as being a legend. But that's not all we've got. We've got a third word that begins with the letter E, and that's the word empty. We have an empty tomb. Jesus' body, the historical record tells us, was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Jewish council. It's sealed. Matthew tells us it's guarded, and yet it's discovered empty that first Easter morning. Now, we could talk the rest of the day about all the historical evidence that the tomb was empty, but I'm just going to give you one fact, because to me this is conclusive, and that's this. Even the enemies of Jesus admitted the tomb was empty. How do we know? Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the enemies of Jesus said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now think about that. They're admitting the tomb is empty. They're trying to explain how it got empty. It's a cover story. It's like if you're a teacher and a student comes up to you and says, the dog ate my homework. That student's admitting, look, I don't have my homework, but I can explain what happened to you. To it, the dog ate it. It's the same thing. So everybody in the first century, whether implicitly or explicitly, everybody was admitting the tomb is empty. That's not really the question of history. The question of history really is, how did it get empty? And you go through the usual list of suspects. The Romans weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus dead. The religious leaders of the day weren't about to steal the body. They wanted Jesus to stay dead. The disciples weren't about to steal the body. They didn't have the motive. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the opportunity. In fact, I found seven ancient sources, six of them outside the Bible, that tell us that the disciples lived lives of deprivation and suffering as a result of their proclamation that Jesus had risen. Why were they willing to go through that? Because a Sunday school teacher told them that Jesus rose? No. Because they saw it on CNN? No. Because they were there. Of all human beings who have ever lived, they were in a unique position. They talked to the risen Jesus. They touched him. They ate with him. Of all people who have ever lived on the planet, they knew for a fact, is this true or is it false? And knowing it was true, they were willing to die for it. Now, how a couple of them died gets a little misty in history. That's okay. 
Their willingness to die is established by seven ancient sources because they knew, being there themselves, that it was true. And then finally, that leads us to the fourth word that begins with the letter E, eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses. Not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and doubters, as well as to believers, to men, to women, to groups, to individuals, indoors, outdoors, daytime, nighttime. People touched them, they talked with them, they ate with them. You get this. Remember I said earlier, we're lucky in ancient history if we have one source to confirm a fact. Or maybe if we're really lucky, two sources to confirm a fact. Well, get this. For the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Jesus. Friends, that is an avalanche of historical data. And in my book, Dr. Michael Lacona spells out all of those uh, uh, sources, the inside and outside the New Testament, to back all that up. So how strong is this evidence? How strong is it? How strong are these four E's? Does it only convince evangelical Christians? Let me tell you about a guy who, when I was in law school, I thought this guy was king. I thought he was the best. Why? He was the most successful lawyer who ever lived. He um, um, is in, it was actually in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most successful lawyer who ever lived. Get, how many, do you have any lawyers here? If you're, if you're not embarrassed to raise your hand there. Yeah, if you, okay, this is going to blow your mind. His name was Sir Lionel Lucku. He won 245 murder trials in a row as a defense attorney, either before the jury or on appeal. Nobody's ever done that in history the most successful lawyer who ever lived. And, and he was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. He became a member of the Supreme Court of his land. And what I liked about this guy, because I was an atheist at the time, what I liked about this guy is I figured this guy knows what evidence is. Right? You can't pull the wool over this guy's eye. This guy can take what looks like an airtight case against his client and find all the loopholes, all the problems with it. And that was true of Sir Lionel Lutku. He didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but he never really checked it out. So one day somebody said to him, Sir Lionel, you're the greatest lawyers ever lived. Have you ever taken your monumental legal skills and applied it to the historical record for the resurrection of Jesus and come to an informed conclusion? He said, no, I haven't, but I will. He ended up spending several years of his life investigating the historical data, and I'll recite to you one sentence he wrote that summarized his conclusion. He said, quote, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. This from the greatest lawyer who ever lived. By the way, I told that story. I used to be a teaching pastor at uh, Saddleback Church out in California, and I just moved out there and, uh, to join that staff. This was many years ago. And uh, a woman came up to me afterwards, and she said, hey, you just moved into our neighborhood. I'm a neighbor. I want to say hi. I said, that's great. Good to meet you. She said, yeah. She said, you know what? I'm Sir Lionel's sister. And she actually gave me some of his personal papers that he had done as he did his investigation. It's a fascinating story. And I ended up in 1981, coming to the same conclusion. Because in my life, I was an atheist. My wife, who was kind of spiritually confused, maybe an agnostic, she met a woman who was a Christian who shared Jesus with her and invited her to a church like this. And my wife attended. She asked questions. And then she came to me, and she gave me the worst news any atheist husband could get. She said, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus. I thought, oh, brother, here it comes. She had to turn into some holy roller or something. I mean, this, this wasn't part of the deal. First word that went through my mind, divorce. I was going to walk out. But then I thought, maybe I could rescue her from this cult that she's gotten involved in. And even as an atheist, I recognized I could easily do that if I did just one thing, disprove the resurrection of Jesus. And so I decided to take my journalism training. I was legal editor of the Chicago Tribune at the time. To take my journalism training, my legal training, 
and systematically investigate, just like Sir Lionel did, the evidence in history. And I spent a year and nine months of my life doing that. And I remember on November the 8th of 1981, I came to the same conclusion that Sir Lionel Luck who came to. And I, I remember sitting there. I remember saying to myself, you know, a good juror reaches a verdict. After two years, the evidence is in. i got to reach a verdict. And I remember I gathered all the research material I had picked up over the years, you know, documents and papers and, and, and journal articles and, and, and books and all this stuff, and I kind of reviewed it one last time. And then I stepped back and I said, wait a second. In light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. I mean, the scales went like that. And that's when I reached my verdict in the case for Christ, that Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. But then I thought, am I done? Is that it? Do I just go on living my life like I did? What, what, what happens here? And my wife pointed out a verse to me, John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I noticed the key words of that verse form an equation of what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. So I said, okay, I get it now. I believe based on the data of history. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He backed it up by returning from the dead. I get it. I believe it. But that's not enough. The Bible says even the demons believe that, and they shudder. There's another step I had to take. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift. Free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And when I would receive this free gift of God's grace, then I would become a child of God. So I got on my knees, and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. Amen. And, and just like my wife, I mean, my values, my character, my morality, my worldview, my philosophy, my attitudes, my relationships, my marriage, my parenting. I mean, over time, as I was baptized, I became part of a vibrant church like this. As I learned to read the Bible with fresh eyes, as I learned to pray, God began to change it all in my life for the good, for the good. Friends, you know what the good news is? God is real. God is real. But you know what the better news is? You can know him. You can experience, you can be in a relationship with him in this world. There'll be the joy of your life. And then you can have confidence that when you pass into the world to come, you will spend eternity in his presence. You can know. Um, so let me just end by talking to two groups. Most of us here are followers of Christ. You've been adopted as a child of God. And to you, I want to say, you are actually given a command in Scripture. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, and do it gently and respectfully. Friends, that admonition from Scripture is ever more important these days. Why? Because we live in a hostile culture. We live in a, 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 a skeptical culture. And our children and our grandchildren are going to be challenged in their faith in a way that we haven't been. I was talking to a guy who said, my granddaughter is six years old. She goes to public school. She was on the playground at recess, and the other students were taunting her and making fun of her because they said, you believe in fairy, because she believes in God. Oh, you believe in fairy tales. You believe in make-believe. Friends, our kids, our grandkids are going to be challenged in their faith like never before. And so we need to be knowledgeable about not just what we believe as Christians, but why we believe it. What are the reasons that point us toward it? That's why I wrote this book, Is God Real? And I hope you can read it. It'll deepen your own faith. It'll make you more courageous in sharing it with others. I hope you read the book and you give it to somebody who's spiritually confused. Um. Uh, because there's a culture out there that's going to attack in a way that 
our generation never saw. So we need to be ready. And then finally, I want to say this. Some of you are here because a friend invited you. And, and you're just the kind of person that would love to type into a computer search engine, is God real? Because you're not sure. You don't really know where you stand with God. You know, the first verse I ever memorized as a new Christian comes from 1 John. It says, These things were written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you in a sense of confusion, anxiety, apprehension over what, it, where you stand with him. It says you can know, you can have confidence. Um, go back to John 1.12. If you receive Jesus as your forgiver and leader, if you receive this free gift of God's grace, this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, you can have confidence that you have been adopted into his family forever and you'll spend eternity with him in heaven. Let me ask you a question. Are you sure that you're in the kingdom of God? Are you sure? Do you know for a fact? Are you confident? I couldn't come all the way down here. We were in Denver to come all the way down here and not give you an opportunity to make sure, to make today the day you drive a stake in the ground, say, no, this was the day. And if ever a question comes up, no, no, no. On that day, I prayed with Lee, and I know I've been adopted by God on the basis of the Word of God. Friends, if you want to take that step and be sure, I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. Just in your heart, repeat this prayer. You don't have to say it out loud. God will hear you. He knows your heart. So let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you want to take that step, just in your heart, say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. You proved it by returning from the dead. And right now I confess the obvious, which is that I'm a sinner. I know that. I've done things, I knew they were wrong before I did them. I did them anyway. I've sinned, and I confess that, and I want to turn from that. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive. I want to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased for me on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much that you endured the torture of the cross so we could be reconciled forever. Help me, Jesus, to live the kind of life that you want me to live. Because from this moment on, I am yours. And now, Father, we know, based on the authority of your word, that anyone who comes to you in repentance and faith receives this free gift of grace, you've adopted them as your son or daughter forever. We celebrate that. We celebrate that. And we thank you for your great love for us. We don't deserve it. We didn't, never earned it. We could never earn our way into your love. It's unconditional. You love us. We thank you for that. And I thank you for this church. I, I think of the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, who said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And I think of this church kind of like a city on a hill, just shining your message of hope and grace and love and forgiveness and eternal life and justice, shining that message all over the planet. We celebrate that. We pray for a blessing on each person here, and we give you all of the glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our forgiver, and who is our leader, and who is our very, very best friend. And all God's people said, amen, amen. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. 
Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.